to the, what was it, the, either the Treatment Free Facebook group or the Wisconsin Treatment Free? Probably both. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I started the Wisconsin Treatment Free shortly after I finished all, all the Solomon's podcasts. Like yeah. Me going to the Bee Association meetings and stuff. Yeah. Um, those guys are really, are really cool. They're, I really enjoy going to those meetings, but, uh, they're all commercial guys. Right. And so, um, they have a lot of, they have a lot of good working knowledge that we use and stuff, but, uh, really they didn't have a whole lot for us as far as <laughs> like doing hobby stuff. You know, they're, they're doing it for a slightly different reason than a lot of people. Right. Yeah. They're doing it as a business. It's a farm and that's yeah. cool. And they've been doing it that way and that's cool too. But, uh, a lot of stuff that before I came upon Solomon, I was reading Michael Bush's stuff. And yeah. It's similar to what most people that are hobbyists are that want to do treatment free stuff run into. I just kind of wanted to have a start a network in Wisconsin. I saw there was similar, um, similar pages to the Wisconsin one in other states, yep. mostly down south. But we didn't have one here, and I know, um, like Charlie Byersdorf is a, is a pretty big name yeah. in Wisconsin as far as that goes. What about you, Ethan? Are, are you uh, hoping to become a, a migratory beekeeper and go down to Florida in the summer, oh, in never, the winters? Or? Never, never. Uh, I think those guys are, are doing a good thing. I think you can... I think you can take uh, good genetics down there and breed from those and send them back up north. Uh, main example, Sam Comfort. He is himself, I would call it like a nomadic beekeeper because his bees are stationary, but he moves with the seasons. Right. Uh, and he's breeding amazing bees uh, in Florida and that are able to do well in the north because of genetics that he's taken down there. He goes down to Florida and breeds all winter, and then he comes back in, I think he says April, and starts his thing up in the north. Um, and I don't think migration is the best technique always. Um, you know, I think there's tons of amazing beekeepers that don't migrate. Uh, two would be in Vermont, which are Kirk Webster and Mike Palmer, um, mm -hmm. that never move their hives. But in the north, that sets you back, you know, quite a few months as far as queen cells. You know, you can't get a good queen cell out till probably June 1st. And even that's probably pushing it. So to be able to, to sell queens on a commercial level, you need around, you know, 100 plus mating nukes, which takes up a lot of resources. And then probably, you know, 50 uh, cell builders, which is another resource. To take. You know, it takes you a while to become a successful northern commercial queen producer and nuke producer due to uh, season constraint uh, as far as long winters and, and right. short summers. Yeah. There is Kirk Webster that is 100% treatment free, uh, breeds all of his own queens, uh, still produces tons of honey, uh, and gets bees through the winter. The world itself is uh, in trouble in, in a lot of different ways. I think uh, not only the bees are in trouble, but you know humanity in and of it, itself is is probably in trouble the way we treat the land and um, the what we eat and what we feed the cows that we eat is is uh, Horrible, which is probably why a lot of people have cancer and, and a lot of health issues. My journey started out organic gardening and then uh, I wanted to bring in some bees to have some pollinators, right? And uh, it, I just fell in love with bees, and it blew up from there. I have like a quarter acre garden uh, that I, I produce produce for a lot of my neighbors. Uh, I think there's a lot of healing powers and things that that people overlook as far as eating well and, and living a wholesome life. And, you know, I'm a Christian. I I think there's something to do with with the universe and and God and how it all relates. It's all a symbiotic relationship between us and God and Mother Nature and beekeepers and farmers. You know, I mean, it's such a huge, a huge realm of things that have to come together to, to make this thing work. Um, and and treatment-free beekeeping is it fits right into that. And, yeah. And we all need to, to do our part in that as far as stewarding Mother Nature and, and the bees. One thing I see on all the treatment-free 
uh, pages on, on Facebook, which is why I originally went away from Facebook because it's, it is good in some ways. You learn tons and tons of stuff from Facebook and, and, and books and, and other beekeepers, which is why I'm here. What's, you know, that's why I'm doing this is to teach people. You know, I want people to know what to do and how to do it. But I see that, you know, these people want to be treatment free beekeepers. Okay. And being on the pages is another great place to start. But the wrong place to start is is buying a package of bees from a commercial beekeeper and, and dumping them in any hive configuration. But what you're doing is you're just killing, a, you know, you're killing 3,000 bees in a queen when you do that. Because you can't take a commercial package that's been, that's been mistreated for years. I mean, I'm talking like these guys are... are putting in blue towels that are soaked in acid on top of your on these bees before they come to your house right okay and, and not only are they putting like acid towels in their hives they're using auxilic acid in between the the acid towels feeding them high fructose corn syrup so unnatural diet they're migrating them and it, it's super super degrading to the to the colonies regardless of what these commercial guys say they They'll say that they're keeping the bees alive, and that's fine. I, I get it. Um, I don't condone commercial beekeepers because we need those guys because I really like almonds. So um, yeah, I need them to go pollinate the almonds. You're hitting a dead end when you buy these packages because they're not made to live treatment-free. That's not how they've been raised. Right. You know, that's like putting me in with a bunch of cows and expecting me to eat grass and be able to sustain life. It's not going to happen. I think if you're going to start with a package it takes an ex, you know an extensive amount of stewardship to get those packages to keep them alive not only keep them alive but to get them to the winter if you live in a northern climate which which i live in honestly i think i think that you should before you even start keeping bees i think you should read your read read the stuff on basic beekeeping get the equipment make sure that that's what you want to do and go trap some yep Right. I think I think you learn more trapping yep. than you do killing that first year's package, and I'm I you know I'm guilty of that. When I first started, yep. I we killed the package, yep. and but you don't know any better. But I think that's one thing that people don't realize is like just because you don't see them, you know, doesn't mean that they're out there. And who cares if you don't have any bees in the first place? If you don't trap any the first season, just try again next season. You're not out anything. Yep. If you right. if you buy a package, then you're out 150 bucks at least because you're gonna <laughs> just kill them unless yeah. for miraculous. I think reason, there's ways to know. get. I think there are ways to uh, to get packages uh, through, but like I said, right. it takes a substantial amount of stewardship. Don't just dump them in your hive and right. and let them be. I think the the best situation is to to get your bees in the hive, whichever configuration you're gonna have. You know, regardless of your hive. And after they have filled one box, you need to, to split these bees or take the old queen away and allow them to raise a new queen. And what that does is that gives you the opportunity for this queen that you're raising to mate with your local drones. Yep. So now this queen goes out, she hatches from her cell and she goes out on her mating flight. And she goes to a, a drone congregation area. Well, within those drone congregation areas, you, you have your drones from your package, which are eh, mediocre. You have most likely some surrounding beekeepers because everyone's like, like us, you know, they, they want to save the bees, which is great. So you got some possibly some overwinter genetics from another beekeeper. And then within all those other drones, you got a shot of getting some feral genetics for in, in with these drones. You have uh, feral drones that are in these drone congregation areas. So what that does is it gives you a chance to, so one queen will mate with a, with 20 drones, around 20 drones, before she returns. And that gives you a chance to get some of those feral genetics into your package bees. Right. And so you're saying uh, it all really starts with splitting that. Got to. So if that it kind of forces them to raise a new queen yes. that has to go out and... Yes. Yes. Okay, and the next question, I know some of people are going to ask, 
how do you split your bees? Okay, I see this question on Facebook like a million times a day, like, how do you do it? What do you do? Right. So yeah. if you don't want to split your bees, so say you have one package and one hive, and you don't have anywhere else to put these bees except for in your hive. So you can't do a split. To do the split successfully, all you have to do to get a new queen in your hive is to open up the box, find the old queen, and just smush her. And now that's going to take a hard heart, but that's what you got to do because she's not going to make it. I've 80% failure rate with packages. Right. And if you only have one, that means you, you're doomed. If you, you know, I just think that you have to, regardless if you started with 10 or 20 packages, you need to split every package and get new genetics within your apiary as soon as possible. And, you know, doing that, like Josh said, you, you, you need to trap bees. You need to get, you know, as many bees as possible um, from a local source or a feral source to to sustain your apiary. You're not going to be able to do it with packages or nukes or anyone else. It, it is impossible to do it by buying bees. I mean, you have to start somewhere, but you have to you have to reproduce from the bees you get to to mate with your local bees or it's gonna fail every time no matter what you right. do what bees you start with i don't care if you start with so there's vsh bees varroa sensitive hygienic bees there's minnesota hygienic bees there's there's latshaw apiaries there's vp queens there's kirk in vermont there's mike palmer they're all selling queens but they are not in your neighborhood they're not your next door neighbor and if they are, you need to go get their bees. If you live next to Mike Palmer or Kirk Webster, just go knock on the door and get you some bees. Cause, set up a trap. Yeah, set yeah. up a trap and you'll be fine. But for us that are not, you have to find local bees within your area, whether that be by trapping or by buying. And, and you have to start local. You, you have to do it locally. Yeah. Uh, well, you guys know uh, Jason Bruns? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I talk with Jason every once in a while. Um, We've had a couple of phone conversations, and uh, him and I, well, yeah, I guess I can't speak to what he feels about me, but <laughs> I feel I feel like we um, are pretty kindred spirits, and his philosophy on, on just, like, catching bees and raising bees mirrors mine. Uh, yeah, pretty, he's, he's pretty phenomenal. Good. He's a very... Yep. At the end of every video clip I've watched of his, it says, if you're not already doing it, get your traps out there. Right. Yep. Yep. It's not too late. Right. It's not too get late. yourself some bees. Yep. So, uh, Joshua, what about you? Um, what's what's your current setup right now with, with bees? Well, well, we are kind of in a semi-urban setting. Um, we're in Clintonville, Wisconsin, so it's not super metropolis, but it's we're right downtown couple blocks off Main Street. Um, we have four hives set up right now. Uh, we had one going into the summer. So I had, I only nice. had, I only had eight traps set out. Um, it was a really crappy spring for it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I kept, I kept up talking with people around the state and nobody really caught anything. Nobody was getting called for cutouts until this, the last three weeks here. There was a couple of people that got a couple of hits on their traps. We got two, two. in two separate locations. Um, I purposely this year put mine in heavily forested areas. And I talked with Jason and he said that um, I needed to be really patient with that because I was competing with natural cavities, especially in right. the cardboard floor, forest. They're going to find their own spaces. Yeah. Um, but if I, you know, if I stayed patient, I would at least get one. And I ended up getting two in the forest. So, nice. so they're both. I measured both of the the cell sizes on both of them, are, and they're both sub five, which suggests like a feral colonies. So you you were doing foundationless. Yeah. Yeah. So we run foundationless more. It's a, it's kind of a pain in the ass, but but it but it for only having four eyes, it's you know really not that bad. Right. Um, I get. The little, if you go to like Menards or wherever, they have these little T levels that you can get for camper trailers to level your camper oh, right. out. 
and I just screw those to the top of the tops of my hives. There you go. And then I can adjust it with shims and stuff, but it's just a lot of dicking around for right. You know, but then I don't have to sit there and put foundation in my frames. I can just pop my frames together. How involved are you with the bees? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say 99% okay. involved. Yeah. You know, like so you're just as obsessed as, as he is? Well, here's how this happened. It is, you know, <laughs> one day it was the middle of winter and Josh comes home and he's like, I bought a beehive. <laughs> and it's like, what? It's the middle of winter. You know, and he's like, okay, it won't be here for a while. And um, so long story short, the beehive ended up coming and um, the bees later ended up coming and I wasn't worried until, you know, we had our first bee sitting there and I was like, oh my goodness, now this is happening. Well, it was like, yeah. it was like six o'clock in the morning on a Saturday and the post office called us. Come get, so, your, bees. Come get yeah. your bees. We, we had taken a lot of time. We had researched, um, Josh, I would say even more than I did, but, um, it was kind of fun for me. I was like, just decided to get in on it with him. So, you know. We do almost all of our hives together, and yeah. um, he'll go and he did the storm trapping more than I did because the ticks get pretty heavy uh. sometimes for me. So, um, but like I'll go and I'll help pick them up, or you know if there's a cutout, like we'll go and we'll do that, yeah. or you know just generally being in the bee yard together. And we kind of laugh; it's almost like co-parenting our hives. You know, there's <laughs> a lot of people you have your hive and you make your decision pro and con you're forced to make that right um you know the amount of bee talk that goes on back and forth is is really um kind of inspiring actually yeah. like like the things that he comes up with versus the things that i come up with we have we know a lot of the same stuff but we know a lot of different stuff too so right you it's funny kind of bounce things off of each other and... yeah it's a it's a lot of compromise <laughs> And not necessarily, well, it's not it's necessarily, yeah, it's not necessarily in a bad way. Um, yeah. You know, there's a lot of times where she brings up something and I just, that would have never popped into my head. Yeah. Um, and vice versa. I'm, I'm very utilitarian where she's a lot more nurturing. And so, the, <laughs> so, you know, I want to get, get through stuff, get stuff done and being kind of right in the middle of town, um. One of our biggest hurdles at the beginning was the neighbors. We're very close proximity. We have, you know, the third acre lot or whatever. As far as that goes, my, my swarm traps, I started trapping the DNR land close to our house. And um, I read through the regulations for trapping and I read through the regulations for gathering and stuff. Um, I'm in uh, my daytime profession is I'm a natural resource professional so I'm pretty familiar with the the regulations anyways yeah. I didn't we didn't see anything so no. we went and hung some pies up and a week later I got a call from the DNR <laughs> telling me that I had to take my traps down and I was like well well I referred to them as traps and they referred to them as houses and I said well they're not houses and they it took them a little bit to wrap their head around it <laughs> like trapping right. bees and ultimately they let me keep them there for this summer. Um, but I'm currently working with like higher ups in the state because they want to do a, a statewide permitting process. But our neighbors, you know, they, they've all pretty, pretty much come to like having the bees. They always come over and ask us how they're doing. And yeah, I'm sure have, you give them honey and. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have, we, we have kids that come over over there asking questions and doing stuff. And, Right. Trying to learn about so them. it's so it's been you know it's a heavy agriculture community anyways but I think it's been pretty well received. Mm -hmm. I don't think I think that something that's missed by a lot of uh, beekeepers is just pollinator education in general. Mm -hmm. um, you know I think it's important to remind people that you know honeybees are great. We get. They, they produce something that we can utilize, but um, stuff like mason bees, you know, you want to save bees, plant flowers and put out those bamboo houses, or take a block of wood and drill a bunch of 5 8 inch holes in it. That's the way for your community locally here well, mm -hmm. we're in Sabisky, wisconsin now in case anyone was watching was curious and i work with a i work with a um 
with a commercial organic farm. It's called uh, Sandy Brook Farm. And uh, they plant and uh, sell organic berries uh, and grass-fed beef, sheep, lamb, pigs. Everything is pasture-raised. Part of working with Sandy Brook is that I have multiple access to tons of chemical-free hay fields, which are alfalfa. And also I have tons of access to chemical-free berries and everything I need to, to take care of my bees and give them a, a natural forage and a healthy forage uh, that's chemical-free. Right. Um, that's amazing. Uh, you run into a lot of GMO corn and GMO soybeans and, and a lot of different things. So uh, I think one place compared to what we used to have, you know, the bees that were around 100 years ago compared to the bees that are we're keeping now are much more fragile due to uh, loss of floral sources. Mm -hmm. uh, we live in a monoculture uh, state of farming. Everything is is uh, corn, 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 and bean, 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 and so we've lost a lot a, of nectar sources. Um, so finding a good place that you can keep your bees that is full of chemical-free nectar is very, 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 very key, and I think it's one of the keys that keeps a lot of my bees alive. Find a farmer, find someone to work with. I mean, it, it's amazing. It's a great relationship. Um, you you learn from farmers how to be stewards of the land and stewards of your bees. You want to produce enough honey, I mean, you know, to, to sell. I mean, this is a business for me. This is not a, this is not a hobby. Um, so it, I mean, it is both, um, but it's also a business at the end of the day. It's all about the, the, the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And if I came out on top or in the red or in the green, uh, my goal and in beekeeping since day one was would I feed this honey to to my family oh yeah and if that and if that's a yes then you're doing things right and if that's a no you're doing things awfully wrong um, so we're pulling up so this is all usually hay you can tell um, but it's been cut recently which is you know fall dearth you know it's normal um, but this these trees, there's a few basswoods right here, especially this huge one right in front of this massive basswood. They get a huge flow uh, from from this tree right here. So a lot of things I see, uh, I want to touch on just looking at these hives before we get out of the truck. Um, I see a lot of treatment-free beekeepers uh, doing on-the-spot queen rearing or something like that. OTS, that's it. It's my Mel Dissel code, and I think Charlie, what do you say, it? Charlie Byers door? Yeah. Is a huge proponent, you know, so, so yes, that is a way to do treatment free. And, and, and people are selling treatment free queens. But how do you know that, that your queen or your bees can survive with high mite loads if you're never letting them see a high mite load? I mean, look at all these, look at these hives. They're massive. We're going to go into it, but these bees are not only surviving winter and collecting surplus honey for me to sell, but they're able, I know for sure, I can say that these bees survive with humongous mite loads. I mean, the, these bees have never been treated, ever. The only thing they get is a spring split. They all get split in the spring. Otherwise, that's it. They get, that. that's it. The rest of the time they're on their own because I want to make sure that I'm not raising a queen that can survive six weeks and then I split her again. That tells me nothing. That tells you nothing for the genetic of your queens. You don't know if she can survive in a humongous colony like this. It, it's impossible. You don't know if she can overwinter in a triple deep or a single deep or, or two deeps with high mite loads. You don't know. Until you do it, until you're out here testing these bees every day, all year. Superior. I'd rather have a queen that can not only live without treatments, but is bred to be gentle and also collect surplus honey. So that we can do this not only on a hobby scale, but as a business. Treatment-free business. You know, I mean, these are all treatment-free. They say treatment-free bees can't make honey. Well, 
You're looking at you're looking at 600 pounds of honey probably sitting on these boxes. We're gonna find out, but.